Hi, this uh, lecture is titled ECG, the very basics. This video is actually designed to help with a very, as the title suggests, a very basic understanding of ECG interpretation that's geared really more for the students in PA schools, nursing schools, or medical school. So to begin, uh, we need to talk about the electricity of the heart. Um, so first off, you know that the heart has two atria, has a left and right atria, has a left and right ventricle, and there's something called pacemaker cells. And so these pacemaker cells are located in the sinoatrial node, which let me point that out over here. Okay, so I'm gonna use, let's use blue right here. So here's the sinoatrial node, okay, which I'm circling there in blue. Now the sinoatrial node is located in the right atrium, which you can see at the junction between the right atrium and the superior vena cava, which is right over here. This is the superior vena cava. Okay. And so this, as its name suggests, keeps the pace of the heart somewhere between usually 60 to about 100 beats per minute. And what happens is when it gives off its signal or it fires automatically, it will actually send an electrical signal, which you can see with through those arrows going through the atria here. Okay. It sends an electrical wave that goes through both atria, effectively simultaneously, both to the right and left atria. And that electrical signal will then excite the muscle, the cardiac muscle, to contract. Now, as that electrical um, current is moving through the tissue there and exciting the muscle, it's going to converge on this point. Let me change the color here. All right, let's use purple here. All right, it's going to converge at this point right there. And that point is also located really in the inferior aspect, more towards the, uh, the atrium septum, which is called the AV node. Okay, so then the atrioventricular node, this is where the electrical signal from the atria is going to converge. And then there's gonna be a slight pause. And then the uh, atrioventricular or AV node is going to then fire action potentials. And they're going to propagate through what we call the bundle of Hiss. And specifically, it's going to enter into the ventricular septum, which is this structure here in the center that separates the left from the right ventricle. The bundle of his splits in the septum into what we call the right bundle and also then the left bundle. And so the right bundle branch is going to enter into the cardiac uh, tissue on the right ventricle. And the left bundle branch is going to uh, be connected to and send electrical signals to the uh, tissue of the left ventricle. And you can see it heads towards the apex. So that's important, it heads towards the apex. And then it goes up laterally along the wall there. And so moving up laterally along the wall, uh, let's say you take the left bundle branch, for example, heads towards the apex and goes up along the, the lateral wall and turns into what we call the Purkinje fibers. And these fibers are intertwined and interwoven between all the cardiac myocytes located in the ventricles. And the same thing is happening on the, on the right side as well. And so the, uh, the timing of this is very, very fast and it follows this particular pattern. And this pattern gives us what we see on an ECG. So again, just to reiterate, sinoatrial node sets off its electrical activity, all right, fires its action potential. It is connected to the cardiac myocytes located there in the atria. It'll send that signal through all the, the tissue in the atria, it'll converge on the AV node. From the AV node, there'll be a little bit of a pause. Once the AV node then fires, it'll go through the bundle of Hiss in towards the septum and divide into the left and right bundle branches, head towards the apex and then up the lateral wall into the Purkinje fibers where it will excite the uh, cardiac myocytes in the ventricles. The reason it's able to, to conduct this electrical current so fast is because the myocardium is connected uh, via gap junctions. So this is a very, very quick electrical activity. Um, So uh, the heart has a property we refer to as automaticity. And what this basically means is that the heart is actually able to fire action potentials without any kind of external signal. So for example, uh, the nervous system, which can actually cause you know, skeletal muscle to contract, for example, and skeletal muscle relies on that. Uh, so if you disconnect the nervous system from skeletal muscle, skeletal muscle won't contract. However, with the heart, if you were to disconnect the nerves, the heart will continue to beat. And that's in 
in thanks to the SA node, um, which is the pacemaker. So the SA node or the sinoatrial node, okay, again over here, just to, to bring us back to where we were, SA node up there in the, the right atrium, it fires somewhere between 60 to 100 beats per minute. And again, that electrical current is going to go send through the atria, and then here's the AV node right here, bundle of his, and then the bundle branches. Okay, so that's the pathway we just discussed. Now, um, the SA node is the pacemaker because it actually fires its action potentials the fastest. And it's connected via gap junctions to the muscles that surround it, and so it's able to propagate that towards the AV node. The AV node actually can act as a pacemaker. Now, it doesn't do it under normal circumstances, but it would actually fire on its own if the SA node were not to fire at all. So, for example, if the SA node were to be blocked for some reason, uh, and there was a long pause, the AV node could actually then fire, and it could fire somewhere around 45 to 50 or even 60 beats per minute, and that would be the pace that it would keep. And not only the AV node, but the, anywhere, some of the, the cells in the bundle of his, or the specialized cells in the, uh, in, in the bundles, can actually fire automatically. And they'll, they'll fire at, at varying rates, but it's, it's built into um, the physiology of those cells to be able to do that. However, under normal circumstances, they do not. And the reason they do not is because um, the SA node fires the fastest, and so it keeps the pace with the fastest, which is the SA node. Now, <clears throat> the myocytes, the atrial myocytes, which you can see listed up here, atrial cells, okay, and then you also have ventricular myocardium down here, which I'm underlining in purple for you. Uh, you'll, you'll see that they're, they're also listed in this cartoon as being uh, as having automaticity, but it, the, the reality is that uh, cardiac myocytes, uh, they actually do not, um, under normal circumstances, elicit that kind of activity. So they don't act as pacemakers normally. However, damaged myocardium can be what we call, you know, quote unquote, a little bit leaky. And so um, they might actually start to have unsteady baselines and could actually fire. But it's usually more of a pathological issue. And then, of course, over here, this is my little Indiana Jones guy. Okay. Okay, so when we're starting out with ECG, um, we first need to kind of memorize a few of the key pieces, okay? So one of the first keys is understanding the graph paper with which the waves are um, inscribed on. So we need to kind of memorize that. So that's part of like understanding the rules to this. So if we, let me use a different color here. All right. So this is the graph papers. You, you can see here that you can see these dark outlines, okay, right here, which all these dark lines here, those represent what we call large boxes. And then inside each one of those, you can see there it's made up of these tiny little boxes over here, okay? So we have little boxes and large boxes. Now, um, each one of these little boxes, okay, if we're looking along, I'm sorry, if we're looking along here, along the X axis, this is time, okay? So along this is time. And so each one of these little boxes represents a certain amount of time. So every little box, all right, under normal uh, sort of standard calibration, represents 0 0.04 seconds. All right, so this little, the axis along here is in seconds. So it represents 0 0.04 seconds. You can see that up here, okay, up there. That's 0 0.04 seconds. So that means if I have you know one, two, three, four, five of those little boxes that make up one big box or run the length of one big box. That would be a total of 0.2 seconds. So every little box is 0.04 seconds. Every large box is 0.2 seconds. Now, if I wanted to know how many boxes make up one second, well, if it's 0.2 seconds, right, times five would be one second. So five large boxes. So here's, you see from this one right here, all the way over to here is one, two, three, four, and five large boxes. That's one second, that's what you see written up here. All right, that's one second. Now, <clears throat> if we take a look at this axis over here, this is the voltage. Now we're usually dealing with very small voltages, so we usually are calling it millivolts, okay? And so you can see over here the standard calibration for this. Uh, each little box, each tiny little square here, represents 0.1 millivolt, 
which means one large box represents 0.5 millivolts or half a millivolt. So that means that over here, I guess I'll draw it over here, from here to here, two large boxes equals one millivolt. That's standard calibration. And again, when you get an ECG, you should always check the calibration to make sure those are the measurements you're working with. Because um, if it changes at all, that could definitely change the way you interpret your ECG. All right, so again, voltages on the on the y-axis, time on the on the x-axis. And if we're just doing it by measurements alone, um, each little box is one millimeter by one millimeter, uh, which means a big box is five millimeters by five millimeters. Okay, so when we're looking at an ECG, um, we want uh, to really look at three things, ultimately. Uh, one is the duration, all right? So I want to kind of draw your attention down here to the, to the cartoon down here. Um, so you can see the graph paper, you can see the large boxes and the little boxes that we just talked about. And let's take a look at this right here, right? Now you'll notice that it has a duration, so that's looking at the x-axis there. So this duration, you'll notice that this wave, this wave that we're seeing here has a certain amplitude and a certain duration. And so if we take a look at that, we can measure that because we know now what those boxes represent on the graph paper. So you'll notice this wave is only the length of one large box. So the timing of that wave is 0 0.2 seconds, right? If we take a look at the amplitude, it's only one large box in height. That's 0.5 millivolts or half a millivolt. Over here, we take a look at this wave, right? This wave, again, the duration is the same. It's 0.2 seconds. And the amplitude is about twice as much. So it's one millivolt instead of a half a millivolt. Okay. And these are things we're going to be looking at when we look at an ECG. We're going to be looking at durations. We're going to be looking at amplitudes. This gives us information about, uh, about the heart. And then lastly, this, this third point here is configuration. So with configuration, we're really kind of looking at essentially the, the shape, the shape of the wave. In an ECG, there are characteristic shapes to the waves that we need to kind of get used to seeing. And then we'll be able to sort of recognize when something doesn't look quite the way it should. So this cartoon is, is really just a very basic um, representation of, of an ECG, uh, one of the ECG leads. And so what you see here is your, your P, Q, R, S, and, and T, which again, I'll circle that for you. You can see P, all right, here's the Q, R, S, and the T, all right? And that's how we label those particular points along the, uh, this, uh, this ECG. So with the P, Q, R, S, T, first, the very basics, of course, are gonna be that the P, what that represents, is atrial depolarization, okay? The QRS represents ventricular depolarization. The T wave actually represents ventricular repolarization, okay? Uh, the repolarization of the atria kind of gets lost in the QRS complex there. Now, um, so this is to show you that whether we're depolarizing or repolarizing, we're gonna see a wave, okay? If there's no electrical, um, Electrical activity, you'd see sort of a flat line, and those lines we refer to as segments. So there is a PR segment, which is between the end of the P wave and the start of the QRS, and there's an ST segment, which is at the start of the, at the end, excuse me, of the QRS and the start of the T wave, and that's the ST segments. So segments are the lines in between the waves. If we're talking about an interval, an interval includes a segment or a line as well as a wave. So here you can see down here the PR interval. A PR interval is from the start of the, the P wave, okay, to the start of the QRS. And the QRS, we'll call it sometimes a QRS interval or just the QRS complex. You see here it's written as a QRS complex. So the QRS complex from the start of the Q, all right, to the end of that at the end of the S there, when we go back to baseline. So that's the QRS. And then finally, um, the QT interval here, which is uh, from the start of the QRS to the end of the T, so the length of that. And the QT interval tells us the time from the start of ventricular depolarization 
and the time it takes for it to repolarize, which is the end of the T wave there. All right, whereas the PR interval is from the time of atrial depolarization to the start of ventricular uh, depolarization. So that's what those intervals represent. And what we're going to kind of get into as, as we go further along in this, in this uh, lecture is um, more about the timing of that. What specifically is the timing of, say, the PR interval? What is the timing of the QT intervals or the QRS complex, for example? Um, how should PR segments and ST segments look and so on? And that's all going to give us information that we can use uh, clinically. Uh, so we first need to know what the normal is before we can really be good at assessing when there's something abnormal. So just as I was describing on the previous slide, um, you'll notice that the P, the QRS, and the T wave have a certain morphology, which we need to understand, okay, um, and a certain duration, okay, and a certain amplitude. So we're looking at all those features at how, you know, the, the R is, is peaked over there and there's, you know, a small Q over here and how long is the T wave and all that. All that is part of what we're going to learn now in terms of being able to assess what's normal. And again, since this cartoon over here on the left, this guy here, okay, only represents uh, maybe possibly one lead and very basic, uh, we need to understand that there, we're usually working with something called a 12 lead EKG, which just means that there's going to be 12 leads, so 12 different versions of that P, Q, R, S, and T. And they may not all look the same because each lead looks at the heart slightly differently. And so therefore it gives us slightly different uh, morphologies. So with that in mind, looking over here at this QRS, it's just to show you that during a QRS, we have ventricular depolarization. And during ventricular depolarization in one, uh, in one lead, it might look like the QRS that I showed you on the left over there, which you can see down here. That looks very similar to what we just talked about. But let's say I, I took a different lead uh, over here. Another lead might show just that. And so we have uh, specific letters which we designate for that complex. So if it's, for example, if it's only upgoing, which I just circled, that's called an R wave. So any upgoing deflection is an R wave. All right. So you can see here, this is uh, an up, upgoing deflection, the first one. Again, here's an R wave. It's the first wave that's upward going. How about over here, we see that there's two going, upgoing uh, deflections. The first one's called an R. If there's another one that's going upward, it's called an R prime. So you see that little dash there, okay? So any upward deflections in R. If there's more than one, we put prime after it. Now, if the wave is downward going, which you can see over here, okay? If it's downward going, we'll usually refer to that as a Q. If there's only a downward going, sometimes we'll refer to it as a Q or a QS. Over here, what you'll notice is that the initial deflection is downward, which is a Q, and then it goes upward, and then it's an R, because all of the deflections upward are an R. So this is a QR wave. Over here, up in the middle top one right here, it's upward going initially, so we call that an R. But you'll notice that the second half, the deflection is downward uh, facing, so we call that an S. And so the difference between a Q and an S wave is the Q is a downward deflection that comes before the R wave. The S wave is a downward deflection that comes after an R wave. Okay, so over in the our classic example over here in the bottom right, over here, that's a Q is downward going, then there's an R and then an S. Up here at this one, you can see that there's an upward deflection, an R, and then a downward, so it's an S, and then upward again, so it's an R prime. So this is, by definition, how we would label the way some of these waves uh, look. I'm going to draw you what we call the single cell model. All right. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a little electrode over here. An electrode, again, is, is something we put on the surface of the patient that can actually record electrical activity. And so this will be on the surface of the patient. Okay. Now all electrodes have a reference point, which I'm going to put over here, a little black dot there. And so the electrode here is actually has what we call a positive pole. This one has a negative pole. And the negative, the negative pole just represents a reference point from which this positive pole is looking. Okay? So if I take this cell, if it's at rest, now remember at rest means the inside of the, the cell is 
negatively charged. So I'm just going to draw a couple of negative uh, dashes in there, okay? And then the outside of the cell is positively charged, okay? This would be at rest. Remember, we have uh, resting memory potentials that are negative, like negative 70, negative 90, and so on. So this would be a resting, a resting heart, uh, a resting cell, excuse me. All right. Now, let's just say in this cell, it starts to depolarize. All right. And when it depolarizes, I'm just going to say it's going to depolarize on one side first compared to, to the other. All right. And in fact, let me change. Let me change just a little bit here. I want to put in a few more charges, actually. Same principle here. It's negative on the inside of the cell. Okay. Positive charges relative to the inside of the cell there. And the electrode. So this is a key concept. Is that um, the electrodes on the surface of the body, they cannot detect internal charges. Like they don't see the negative charge inside the, uh, the myocytes. But it does see surface charges. So it sees, let's say, all those positive charges there. Now, um, the electrode is actually measuring current. If the charges are all uniform like it is here, meaning all positive charges on the outside of the cell with no negative charges there, then what you have is uniform distribution, or excuse me, uniform charges, all positive, no current, and so therefore, this electrode right here will actually show a flat line. It would show a flat line. There's no current at this particular moment. All right. Now, let's say, for example, that this cell started to depolarize. So the first thing that happens is the inside becomes more positive there, and the outside becomes more negative because we have movements of cations and so on, right? So this start becomes more, starts to de, uh, depolarize here. Depolarize. All right, so it's depolarizing. Now you notice we no longer have a uniform charge. We have negative charges, okay? And then we have our positive charges. So now I have a difference in charge over the membrane. So this difference in charge actually represents a current on the surface of the heart. And current flows from the direction of negative to positive, and the way that we depict that is with a, uh, a vector. And so the vector always points towards the, uh, the positive charges. And if the current is then flowing in the direction of our positive electrode, we're going to now see an upward deflection. We'll see an upward deflection. Okay. Now I'm just going to draw the next cell down here. Uh, remember the first part of that cell started to depolarize. Let's just say at this point, the whole cell has depolarized. So it's the same cell, right? Same cell. But now the entire cell is depolarized. So here's my electrode. All right, here's the negative end. This would be the positive end. All right, it was deflecting upward. And now what's happened here is that I have completely depolarized. So now the charges have all swapped. They're all negative on the outside relative to the inside, which is more positive. That's not the normal resting condition. This is after uh, depolarization is finished. So now at the end of depolarization, I've gone back to baseline over here. It goes back to baseline. Why? Because all the charges on the surface of my cell are all negative. It's all uniform. So that's a baseline. There's no current any longer. Okay? If, on the other hand, or sorry, not if, I should say, now at this point, let's say the cell starts to repolarize. So let's take that as, a, as our example. Let's say it repolarizes. So now I have, um, I'm going to put the charges where they're supposed to be first. So bear with me for a minute. So you notice here, again, here's my electrode. Here's my negative end here. So this is repolarizing on this half of the cell because 
it's becoming negative again and distributing positive charges to the outside, so that's repolarizing. So the question is, what's the vector then, right? I have a current because I have a difference in charge. I have negatives and positives on the surface of my cell, so therefore there's a current which the electrode will pick up. So the vector always points towards the positive charges. So in this case, the vector is now pointing away from my positive electrode over here. And so therefore, the deflection is now downward. And I'm going to draw this last cell down here to kind of finish up my example. So here's my electrode, here's the positive end. And so now the entire side inside of the cell is negative again. It is completely repolarized. The outside is completely positive. And so therefore, what I'm going to see is a wave that looks like this, where there's a negative deflection that goes back to baseline. Back to baseline is our isoelectric point. It's just basically telling you that now I have uniform charges on the surface of the cell, which in this case are positive charges. Okay. Okay, so this is to kind of reiterate what I just talked about um, when I drew on the board and gave you the single cell model. So if, for example, uh, this is our single cell again, and this is our electrode right here. All right, and the reference point for that electrode will be somewhere over here. So it's looking at electrical activity along this axis, let's say. And now remember, a cell, or excuse me, the electrode is placed on the, the surface of the patient's body, and that's what's actually picking up electrical activity. But the electrode's on the surface of the body, which means it can only look at current moving on the surface of the heart. It cannot look at charges within the cells themselves, for example. So it's looking at charges along the surface of the heart. So if if there is a uniform charge over the outside of the heart, then the electrode would be essentially a flat line. It's not picking up any current. The only way we have current is if there's a difference in charge, meaning a difference like negatives and positives, right? So if it's a, let's say the surface of the heart is all positively charged, which would be when the heart's resting because the inside of the cells are negative relative to the outside. So if it's all positively charged, what you would see is just a flat line. I'm just going to draw that over here. Okay, you would just see a flat line, something we refer to on the ECG as an isoelectric line. And it's just flat because there's uniform charge there. There's no current flowing at this moment. But let's say in our single cell example that the cell has now um, depolarized. And what you're seeing in this cartoon is over in this area, we see depolarization because now the inside of the cell is becoming more positive relative to the outside of the cell. And so there's more negative charges starting to accumulate on the surface of the cell there. And this part, this other half, which has the positive charges, has yet to depolarize. So, but now we have a difference in charge on the surface of the cell there. That difference in charge creates what we, have, what we know as a current. And so the current goes from negative to positive, okay? And so if our current's going from negative to positive, the way we depict that is using a vector. And the vector, all right, so here's our vector down here. This is this long arrow, okay? The vector always points towards the positive charges here, okay? So um, that's the direction of what we call our current, would be the direction towards the positive charges. So it goes from negative to positive. And so what we do is we draw a vector pointing at the positive charges. Now, if the vector is pointing at the positive charges and our electrode is placed over here, as I pointed out before, okay, um, and this is what we call the positive end of our electrode. The positive end is sort of the exploratory um, part of the electrode. It's the part that's picking up that current with the negative end being our reference point. So what happens is we have this current moving towards our positive electrode. If it's moving towards that electrode, what you're gonna see is an upward deflection. Okay, so it gives an upward deflection as it's moving towards it. Now, the, the amplitude of that deflection depends on the difference between the amount of negative and positive charges there are. Okay, when it's split 50-50 like this, that's typically when you see the largest, that's the sort of the maximum point there. And then if by the time this whole thing gets depolarized and it's all negative on the outer surface there, because the entire cell has been depolarized, again, that's a uniform charge, which means that now our our wave is going to go back to baseline because, again, there has to be a difference in charge for there to be current for the electrode to pick that up. So that's when we see it go back to, to its baseline. And you're seeing the same thing down here in B, 
only now you'll notice that when the depolarization is occurring, again, this is depolarization, the wave is moving away from our positive electrode over here. So again, if it's resting, it's flat line. But if the wave is moving away from our positive electrode uh, and towards our sort of our reference point here, what you're going to see is since the current's moving away, you see a, a downward deflection instead. Okay. Now over here in this, this cartoon, uh, you can see the, the negative and the positive over here denote the current. Okay, the, the charges, which we, what we were looking at over here with these guys over here. So this negative is just telling you that that's what's depolarizing and it's heading towards the positive charges. So the current depicted by our vector point is pointing at the positive electrode over here and you see an upward deflection. Over here, it's telling me that the current is going the opposite direction. So that's like our case B down here. All right, where here's the positive and negative. So it's the current is moving away from our positive electrode there. And so therefore, what you're seeing is a downward deflection. Now, if our current happens to be actually moving perpendicular, in this case, let's say perpendicular to our electrode, then what you're going to see is a flat line. And this is due to the, um, the vector analysis that I went over in the, uh, on the board with you prior to this. All right, so if you see um, current moving exactly perpendicular to, to that electrode, it's going to move, uh, it's going to show sort of a flat line. Now D is a little bit trickier, okay? And uh, since this is you know, more clinically oriented uh, lecture, I'm not gonna go into a lot of the, the, the physics behind this just now, but understand this, if we were to place this electrode at a different point along when this current is moving, now what this is trying to depict here, okay, is that if the current is moving if the, if the average current is moving perpendicular to where the, the placement of that electrode, this is slightly different from what we're seeing here in C, okay? Um, where we're looking at a, an average current over time, okay? Not just an instantaneous current, okay? But an average current over time. What can, what the electrode, if the electrode is actually placed perpendicular to the vector that's moving past it over time, Okay, what you're going to see is what we call a biphasic wave, where sort of the, the vector is moving towards it and then away from it. So this is where there's an upward deflection while it's moving towards it, and then a downward deflection moving away from it. Okay, and, and so if the upward deflection and the downward deflection are essentially equal to one another, that tells you that this particular lead, this electrode, excuse me, this electrode, its placement on the body is perpendicular to the current that is moving through the heart, to the average current that's moving through the heart at that time. This is actually a very important wave to remember because this biphasic wave, uh, since it represents the fact that that electrode is perpendicular to the movement or the, to the current going through the heart, it helps us to make measurements later on. So it's one that we're gonna to wanna to keep in mind. So to kind of give you a further example on uh, we need to kind of understand what I mean by a mean vector. So you could imagine that uh, at any given time, uh, you you have you know cardiac a bunch of cardiac myocytes that are all firing simultaneously, whether it's in the atria or whether it's in the ventricle, that they might go off at, at the same time. And so that group of cardiac myocytes, let's say it's ten cardiac myocytes that all simultaneously fire they're going to give off electrical, they might give off electrical vectors going in various directions, okay? And then what we do is we take the, the average direction, uh, and that's what's basically being picked up by the ECG at that moment. So it's the same thing as if, um, you know, the ventricle, you know, it may, at any given time, you may have, uh, you know, 10 or 20 myocytes firing at the same time, and it's going to take the average of that at that moment. So for example, the, the example I give down here is if, let's say, you know, they're playing soccer, and from the start of the game to the end of the game, we have our, our goalie over here somewhere, okay? So from the start of that game, he may, he may kick the ball to the, to the right over here, he may be kicking it, you know, straight on over to at this angle, or maybe even directly over to the sides even, 
and then maybe even a couple more over here. If you'll notice that throughout the entire game, he's kicked it through, you know, multiple multiple directions. It looks like, but if we were to take a look at the average direction in which he was kicking that ball, ultimately what we'd find out most likely is that he kicked it really directly towards the other person's goal. Okay. And what we've really done is we've just taken an average of all the different, you know, little vectors and larger vectors. And we've, we've, you know, we've gotten an average. And so what this vector represents over here is a mean vector. It's a mean vector. It's, it's, it's showing a, a, the mean of all the different um, kicks that he had, all the different angles that he gave and how hard he kicked it. Okay. So, and by, by how hard he kicked it, I meant that would be represented by the length of the arrow, for example. So if I give a, a nice large arrow here as the mean, that means that a lot of this, a lot of his kicks were probably really directed towards the other person's goal for the most part. Okay. Um, and so to bring this back to really how, how this works with the heart is that you can imagine instead of having a whole bunch of kicks over here throughout an entire game, let's just imagine that all these arrows represent uh, electrical currents from myocytes firing at the same time instead. So this could be from you know one myocyte over here, this would be a different myocyte, this would be another one, there's a fourth one, fifth one, sixth one, seventh one, and so on. You get the idea. And so let's say that all happened by seven different myocytes and they all fired simultaneously and they fired um, and their currents were going in, in different directions. At that moment, what the electrode is gonna pick up is not, it can't just pick up seven different currents, okay? it's going to pick up a, a, a mean. It's going to pick up an average at that moment. So this would represent those seven or eight that spontaneously fired at the same time and give you a direction. And so the, that direction will then be picked up, that direction of current will then be picked up by the electrode. So here in this, uh, in this slide, you can see what I've shown in yellow here is that this is the mean vector. It's the mean vector over time, okay? Uh, so again, this is taking into account all the little vectors going in different directions by different myocytes, but this is the mean vector. And so what I've done is I've placed an electrode over here. So this is point A, right? Here's point B, and here is C. And so let's just see how each of those electrodes on the surface of the body would actually view that vector moving through the, um, moving through the ventricle. So we take a look at that, it's moving essentially directly towards A. So we see a positive deflection. It's moving away from B. So we see a negative deflection here. And my last electrode over here, C, you'll notice that C is perpendicular, which is what I mentioned a couple slides ago, is perpendicular to that mean vector. So since it's perpendicular to that mean vector, you notice we have a biphasic wave. Again, sort of because it's kind of like going towards it, which is what the upward deflection is, and then away from it, which is the downward deflection. And they're usually, uh, if it's equal, equal upward deflection and downward deflection, we call that a biphasic wave, which usually means that's when it's most perpendicular to that, that electrode. And so that's how those different um, electrodes view the current. It's all giving you a, you know, a quote unquote different view of electrical activity in the heart. All right. So now let's let's put this in context of the uh, clinical context of the leads that we use. So most commonly we use what we call a, a 12 lead ECG. Okay. Now when we say 12 leads, that's because we see a lead is really the graphical representation we see on the paper. Okay. Uh, the electrodes, on the other hand, are what are measuring or are what recording that electrical activity. And usually we have about uh, I think about nine to ten electrodes that produce 12 leads or 12 graphical representations, okay? And again, the electrodes, that would be the things that we're actually putting on the surface of the patient's body, okay? And so, um, you know, of those, we have what we call six limb leads, and so they'll be going on the limbs, and we have six chest leads, ones that go across the, across the chest. So I'm gonna start with just talking about the, the limb leads, all right? So we have six limb leads. And as you can see over here, they're labeled as lead one, two, and three, AVF, AVL, and AVR. 
Okay. Now, those are our six, and that's the labeling for them. And one, two, and three, what, what they have in common, okay, is that they have a positive end and a, a negative end. So we refer to this as bipolar leads. And so you can see here, for example, in one, there's a the positive end, which is on the left arm, and the negative, which is our reference point, by the way, our reference point is on the right arm. So if it's on, if the reference point's on the right arm and our positive lead, which again is our sort of exploratory lead, um, which is trying to kind of pick up on that, that current or electrical activity. So what you're seeing here is our reference goes from that point, from that negative side to that positive. So it's going to be able to pick up anything in that, that particular plane there, all right, along that axis. If we look at two, with the limb leads, by the way, we usually put them on the right, uh, right arm, left arm, left leg, and then the right leg is typically a ground, okay? So here in lead two, you can see the positive is on the left leg, and you'll see that the negative is on the right arm. So again, the right arm is again the reference point here, and you'll notice if that's the reference point to the left leg, it creates a new angle for us. That creates a new angle with which to look at electrical activity. Over here, all right, with lead three, I, you can see the positive end is again the left leg, but now the reference point has changed. The reference point is now the left arm, okay? So that, that creates a new angle. That creates a different angle with which to look at electrical activity. Now with leads AVF, AVL, and AVR, these, the little A stands for augmented, okay? So these are augmented, and, and the difference between these and one, two, and three is that you'll notice, let's take AVF for example. AVF's positive lead here is on the left leg. But its reference point is not the right or left arm. <coughs> Excuse me. It's not the right or left arm, but in fact the average of the two. Since it's the average, that was, that would fall somewhere between the left and right arm. It's the average of the two. That gives us a straight up and down angle, or a 90 degree angle, if you will, to look at electrical activity. In AVL, AVL here's our positive is on the left arm. Okay, but its reference point is not the right arm and it's not the left leg. Instead, it's the average of those two, which again gives us a new angle again. And then finally, if you guys kind of see the pattern here, the positive for AVR is on the right arm. Its reference point is between one and, uh, and the, excuse me, between the um, left arm and the left leg right about here, and that gives us, once again, another angle. So the reason for this is this leads being placed at these various angles uh, gives us a different view of electrical activity in something we call the uh, frontal plane or a vertical plane. So you can imagine that there's like a circle, I should put it like this, like a circle around your heart. Okay, so if I have a circle around my heart, it's basically looking superior, inferiorly, and then left to right, or medial and lateral. Okay, so it's looking from that, that point of view or that perspective at those various angles. And so if we took all these angles that I was just talking about and we actually just superimposed them onto one, uh, onto around the heart, I should say. So here's the heart, okay, in the center of the circle. And all I'm doing is superimposing the reference points, okay, with the, like, for example, here's lead one. And remember, lead one's reference point was over here on the right arm. So it's back over here. This is the, the right arm here it gave us this view right here. So you notice it's the same thing. It's this view right here, straight across, and we call that zero degrees, okay, zero degrees. Now, the, the way in which this is done is that if we go um, clockwise, so we're going clockwise in this direction, the degrees are positive, all the way until we get to about 180 degrees over here, and then once we get above 180 degrees, it starts to become negative, or if we're above zero degrees over here, that's the, ne that's the negative. Okay, so we see that with one, and if we take a look at two, so here's two, here's lead two. Let's take a look at two over here again. So here's two, and I told you the reference point was the uh, left leg, oh, excuse me, the left reference point was the right arm, and the, the positive end was on the, the left leg there, which created an angle like this, this type of an angle. So let's take a look, here's two, and here's our angle, right? That's our angle that we just saw, our reference point being over here. Okay, that was the reference point. And the degree 
that we're looking at the, the electrical activity there is 60 degrees. And these are fixed degrees. These are degrees that we need to know. Okay. Let's take AVF. AVF over here. Just to remind you, that was the reference point was between the left and right arms, which gave us a 90 degree. So that's this like this. All right, so our reference point was here. All right, our positive end was down here. This is 90 degrees. You can see three gives us an angle over here like this, and so on. Okay, so each one of these these uh, these leads have given us a different degree, uh, and we're going to see in the upcoming slides how we use these degrees here to make measurements on the heart to be able to figure out different pathologies, um, and it gives us a, a good bit of information. So again, these are the limb, we call these, we refer to those as the limb leads. One, two, three, um, AVF, AVL, and AVR. Those are your six limbs. And again, it's looking at it um, as if I was, you know, drawing a circle around my heart like this so I can see superior, inferior, medial, and lateral angles of the heart. Uh, now, what's actually clinically useful for us to understand about these angles is um, we need to kind of group them together. So for example, let's go back to my circle over here where there's the heart. And that's the heart, let's say, in our, our normal anatomical position, which faces with the apex facing more towards the left side. Okay. And then you see over here, here's the base of the hearts, which is more superior. And if you'll notice over here, one and AVL, one and AVL are on what we call the left lateral side. So here, I'm gonna draw this there. That's the left lateral aspect of the heart there, which is primarily the left ventricle. So it's looking at the lateral wall of the left ventricle. So AVL and one, we tend to group those together. So when we're looking at an ECG, look at one and AVL in context to one another because they're looking at a similar, uh, the similar anatomy of the heart. So that's why it says over here, left lateral leads, one in AVL, their degree. One is zero degrees, and AVL is negative 30 degrees. And you can see the, the arrows over here to kind of depict that as well in the cartoon. We also group down here, you'll notice these three, two, three, and AVF. They're looking at a very similar an, uh, anatomical structure of the heart, which is the inferior aspect of the heart, or the inferior wall of the heart. The portion of it that really sits on the diaphragm, which has a, a part of it's going to be the, the right ventricle, as well as the left ventricle. So we call those the um, inferior leads. So you can see here, two, three, and AVF, we group those together because it's looking at the inferior aspect, which is typically interpreted as the inferior aspect of the, uh, the left ventricle. All right, and these will be the degrees that are associated with that, as you can see there. Now, AVR, <clears throat> excuse me, AVR is way over here. You can see over there, and you, you, you'll notice that the AVR, for the most part, is what we're going to learn, is that electrical activity moves really down towards the apex in general. So I'm going to just draw that in here real quick. Electrical activity on the whole tends to go in this direction. I'll have to excuse my really bad cartoon here, but this is, an, this is a really sloppy arrow that I just drew in there. But electrical activity tends to point... You know, towards this direction over here in that angle, that quadrant, if you will. All right. And that's away from AVR. AVR is, for the most part, located kind of in the opposite direction of where we're going to see most of our electrical activity. Um, but we'll, we'll use that because it does become, you know, it can be, be a useful reference point as well. But it would look at anatomically, if we're talking about just anatomically, it, it's, it's looking at really the, the right the right aspect of the heart there. So we call it a right-sided lead. So now the other leads um, are the chest leads, sometimes referred to as the precordial leads. So these are another six. So this is the other six of the 12. The difference with these six is these, again, are located across the chest. So it goes across, starts on the right side of the sternum, which you can see over here, starts on the right side of the sternum and then goes across the chest and into the axillary region there. And the placement of this lead, instead of with the limb leads where you have, we're looking at it sort of superior, inferior, medial, and lateral, here you're looking at it more three-dimensionally. It's coming out anterior or posterior. So that's what this is trying to depict over here, is that it's, it's really coming out towards you or away from you. Remember the heart is three-dimensional. 
So we can't just look superior and inferior medial and lateral. We also have to look anterior to posterior. So this gives us the full three-dimensional electrical picture, if you will. Um, and so that's giving us uh, any kind of electrical movement, again, that's moving anterior okay, or posterior uh, to the leads. And so we usually label V1 and V2. Okay, so V1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So it's V1 through V6 are your precordial leads. Now, V1 and V2 are typically referred to as the septal leads because they usually overlie um, the, the ventricular septum. This cartoon doesn't really quite show that. V1 and V2 can also sometimes overlie the right atrium. So this is the right atrium right here. So this in this cartoon, it's depicting as lying over the right atrium, which can be the case. Um, but often referred to as the septal leads because most times it's overlying the septum, which is right here. V3 and V4 are referred to as anterior leads. And so V3 and V4, which you can see over here, they're on the anterior aspects of the left ventricle. Okay. And then V5, V6, unfortunately, I think my video is cutting that off a little bit, but V5, V6 are also showing at the left lateral aspect of the um, left ventricle. So what I have over here is say V1 and V2 are septal leads, V3 and V4 are anterior leads. 1, AVL, V5, and V6 are all referred to as left lateral. Again, because V5 and V6 are all the way over in the axillary region over here looking at the lateral aspect of the left ventricle again. And then 2, 3, and AVF are the inferior leads. And none of the precordials look at the inferior aspect there other than 2, 3, and AVF.